the good news is we're all in this together and when we see we're together Energy Week with George Harvey and the famous Tom Fennell. In the flesh. <laughs> Philanthropist, <laughs> Philanthropist and world traveler. Every day I, I gather up what news I can of energy and climate change and each item I get I, I uh, put together a 50, 55 word synopsis and a link to the original article and I put together 10 to 15 of these that are grouped together in a posting for the day at my blog geoharvey.com um, and you can go there and find the articles that we're going to be talking about if you um, pay attention and we pay attention and remember to do it we will we will keep you up to date on what day the the articles we're talking about were, was posted and um, and some of them are pretty good and in depth. I'll try and remem remind you of that in case you want to follow up, because some of them are yep. well worth following up. Some of them are worth reading. So we're going to start today. Is the we're recording this on the first of March at the BCTV studio, and um, we're starting a week ago today on Thursday, February twenty second, and we're going to start with an art article from a publication called Think Progress. And we got a picture coming up. We do. There it is. Oh my goodness, that looks scary. <laughs> it is scary. <laughs> it is. <coughs> Stunning new research finds fracking a major source of carbon pollution <coughs> in Pennsylvania. Stunning? Stunning. <laughs> Where have they been? I don't know. <laughs> a study found that methane escaping from oil and gas industry sites in Pennsylvania, quote, causes the same near-term climate pollution as 11 coal-fired power plants, end quote, and that this is, and that is, five, quote, five times higher than what oil and gas companies report, end quote, to the state. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> According to the Environmental Defense Fund analysis based on 16 peer-reviewed studies. So that what they've done here is a meta-study of 16 studies, and this is the overall r result and that picture is a um, is flaring it's a flare yeah um, what wh what happens with oil and gas is that you inevitably have a certain amount of gas coming out that you cannot capture uh, or at least not from a practical point it's of view it's not practical to capture yeah. so what they do is they flare it because it's not good for the environment much better to flare it. If flaring it, you release carbon dioxide, but if you don't flare it, you're releasing methane, which is far more powerful. Um, greenhouse gas uh, uh, problem, it but... It traps 86 times as much heat as CO2 right. over a 20-year period. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. But in addition to that, I mean, they've, they've been flaring gas from, from uh, oil sites Forever. Forever. Absolutely. They did it because it wasn't safe to have methane f flying around the, the area where these things were being done, so they trapped just, it and piped yeah. it off a little bit. And of course, the reason why they can't capture it and use it is because it's contaminated with probably air, nitrogen, you know, whatever, and it would be too expensive to remove that stuff from it. So, should we move on, Tom? Or do you have something about well, this? Well, if, if you've been watching this show, this is no surprise. No. But it says here, methane emissions are responsible for about a quarter of the human-caused global warming the world is experiencing today. And natural gas is not part of the solution. It's part of the problem. Yeah. So let's move on. Okay. We're, we're up to um, an item from Clean Technica. This about is an cars. Interesting one. Porsche no longer building diesel-powered vehicles. I didn't know they did it at all. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, I've been hearing more and more and more. You know, I, I, I can see 20 reports, but if they're on the same thing, only one of them makes it onto the blog. Yeah. And, and the, the business of German 
um, diesel cars is something that just keeps coming up over and over and over and over again. And um, the Germans have been very uh, fond of diesel cars ever since the gas crisis. And um, here well, is... Well, the, the diesel cars that they're making in Europe today are not your grandfather's diesel like no. I'm driving. No, I they're mean, not. That, that, the car that I have is slow. And these European diesels aren't slow. I, yes. I rented a Ford in Ireland a couple of years back, and it was peppy. I was very surprised. It was yeah. a diesel. According to Autocar, Porsche has stopped installing diesel engines in any of its vehicles, effective immediately. The move is certainly t tied to recent developments that have tarnished the once glittering reputation of diesel. German regulators ordered Audi to halt to, I'm sorry, to recall 127,000 cars fitted with the latest Euro 6 spec diesel engines last month. There's been a lot of cheating going on because oh, yeah. the they're not specifications... Make, they're not make, meeting the specs. They're not meeting the specs. So they're that, playing games. What you were saying about Peppy is the problem. You, you, yeah. you can meet yeah. the specs, but you have to reduce the, <laughs> the um, that's, that's true. power to do it. And, it. and they've been pretending, I guess, that the car is running when it is driving on the road when it's not. Right. And I'm sorry, by the way, that I'm sniffling. I've got a cold. I hope that, Tom, you know, do you, can you infect somebody through a television? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you can infect me. I hope you don't. I hope I don't. It's not a bad cold. It's, it's a pretty gentle cold as such well, things One go. of the things that's happening with uh, Porsche is uh, their buyers are going electric. Yes. Fully half of the new model Panamera, which I don't even know what it is, is electric, or at least it's it's hybrid. Yeah, yeah. It's plug-in hybrid. So plug -in hybrid. Something's, something's happening over there. Yes, they're seeing changes. Well, okay, let's move along. our we, next item is from Clean Technica. Here. Yes, we've got a picture. Yeah, Why don't you show the picture? Let's get this guy up there. That's kind of a pretty, <coughs> pretty picture there. Yep. There's a lot of pictures in this article, if you want to see it. It's an interesting article. Well, I'll let you tell us where it is. Well, it's in Clean Technica. Wind power results in very few bird deaths. <coughs> you know, this is something that I've been, I've been paying a lot of attention to for years. Yeah, you have. We've talked about it on yep. the show. A high estimate of the number of birds killed in collisions in U.S. wind turbines and their towers is 573,000 per year. The researchers said the actual number is probably between 140 and 328,000. Even the highest of those numbers is very small compared to the number killed, generating the same amount of power from, from fossil fuels. And, you know, it, this is simply the case. Birds are killed. Well, well, part of what's going on is there are people who forever, whatever their reasons are, hate wind. Yes. And in order to make, to buffer their argument, they're coming up with everything. Everything. And they're taking uh, statistics that are based on 20-year-old wind towers that were made with latticework construction. Right. And trying to bring it up to date and blowing it way out of proportion. Well, there's another thing, too, that's interesting here, and that is they want to regulate, they want stiffer regulations on taller wind turbines. Yeah. And the and the the big wind turbines that are made today they're are not, necessary. They're not killing the birds. They're not killing the <laughs> birds because most birds don't fly that high. <coughs> I got I got a look a couple of numbers <coughs> here. Billions of birds are killed by cats. Cats are number one. Right. Okay. Collisions with communication towers. Second, they kill about six and a half million birds. Nuclear plants kill about four hundred sixty thousand. About the same number as wind turbines. Fossil fuel plants twenty four million. Yes. And electrocutions kill 5.4 million birds more. Birds yes. sitting on top of towers. Well, the, another thing that they do is they, a lot of birds, and a hawk wouldn't do this, but, a, but you know, the, one of the things that I read uh, a couple of weeks ago, the great Indian bustard is a big bird that is very rare that lives in India, and they fly into transmission lines. Okay. The transmission lines, unlike the wind turbines, the transmission lines are fairly low. Yeah. And the, the bustards are, are not um, 
predatory birds, so they don't. Their eyes are not focused ahead; they're focused they out to the sides, yeah. and they fly don't along. See them. They don't <laughs> see that they're that they're approaching these these uh, power lines until it's too late, and they crash into them. <coughs> All right, should we go on? I think we should go on. Okay, we're up to Friday, February twenty third. And we have an island, uh, island. We have an item now from the Daily Times. How? General Electric gambles on fossil fuel power and loss. General Electric has been having trouble. They have. Really. And last March, executives of GE powered plant business gave Wall Street a surprisingly bullish forecast for the year. Despite flat demand for new, power ga uh, new natural gas power plants, they said GE's power revenue and profit would rise. But GE's forecast turned out to be a mirage. Well, they read the market wrong. They thought the market was going to continue going for conventional turbines. Yeah. And wind and solar have gotten so cheap. The conventional turbines don't make sense anymore. This is, you know, we they should have been watching us. Yeah. They would have yeah, known. Yeah, they'd have known this. Um, <laughs> the, the, I don't know when we started talking about about natural gas no longer expanding anymore. The, the numbers came out yesterday, I think it was yesterday, for the year of, of 2017. And I, I mentioned earlier that natural gas... <coughs> um, plants were producing less electricity than they had on a month by month basis than they had been the year before okay and um, each the average that the decline on month by month was over 10 percent well in the last quarter natural gas picked up a little bit and it didn't decline by 10 percent it may actually have increased slightly but nevertheless for the whole year, Production of electricity from natural gas declined by seven and a half percent in the United States, and that's significant. You know that if you're talking to a businessman and you say, "What happens if you lose seven and a half percent of your of your sales?" He's going to be unhappy with that idea. Well, here we've got GE producing turbines for an industry which is experiencing decline. Yeah, and they didn't. Look, in, look at that properly. Well, I think we had a, a how would you say it, a uh, group of people in power there yeah. who were promoting a certain kind of growth yes. and very optimistically looking at growth of turbines, yes. which didn't fit their... What they their, were doing, right, Tom, I think, was they were projecting future growth on the basis of past growth, which is a bad idea. They were doing exactly that. Yeah. It's and it's interesting because, among other things, GE has fired the whole damn bunch of them. <laughs> They've replaced them all. Yeah, with people who know better, maybe, I hope. Well, people who have a different outlook, anyhow. GE... I think they were, you know, they were just, what would you say, patting themselves on the back and... Uh, yeah. That's but they were wrong. That's unfortunate. Anyway, should well, we move on? Yeah, we got a nice picture coming up here. N uh, this, this, new, this, new this one I like. Yeah. This one I like. This is good. This is from New Hampshire Public Radio. Moose and loons are climate change canaries in the coal mine. And those birds, by the way, are loons. I like, I love loons. I think they're pretty. Yeah, and I love their mournful uh, tune. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was reading this, I, I, I tuned up to uh, YouTube. Yeah. And I got a half an hour of loon Oh, my music. gosh. <laughs> I didn't listen to the whole half hour, yeah. but they're, they're, they're fun. Conservationists say two iconic New Hampshire animals, moose and loons, show how climate change will reshape the region. On the same day they talked about their research at the Audubon Society in Concord, New Hampshire, set new records for winter warmth. It was 48 degrees on the snowless Mount Washington summit. The temperatures this year have been crazy. Absolutely. 48 Absolutely. degrees on the Washington, Mount Washington summit? You could do that in the summer. There'd be, night, there'd be days when that would be a warm day in July. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I went up there once uh, um, in July, and it was 73 degrees, and I was told it was the warmest they had been all summer. Well, that, that's believable. That's really quite believable. 
Well, the article says that the loons may not be facing an immediate existential threat in New Hampshire, but the birds are contaminated with mercury from pollution from fossil fuels. Yeah. And there's something to watch. On the other hand, the moose are in trouble. They're in trouble. They're, they are in deep trouble. It's an infestation of ticks that are affecting the young moose. Um, and they've got so many ticks on them that they're killing them. Yeah, uh, uh, people don't understand this. Um, a, I, I talked to naturalists in, in New Hampshire, and they said this is not a tick that most people have ever seen. It's what they call a winter tick. In, in Vermont, the naturalists call it a moose tick. And um, these winter ticks, a uh, fully engorged adult female winter tick is about the size of a grape. Yeah. Yep, and I they have that. found as many as 75,000 of these things on one moose. Of course, the moose was dead. But, I would imagine. But um, the naturalists in New Hampshire said they're killing 80% of the moose calves. Well, the article was not very optimistic about the, uh, the uh, survival of moose. This, by the way, is the result of climate change. Those ticks hadn't been around. The, the problem moose have is they can't, uh, they don't have an instinct to groom themselves right, for so ticks. And the reason for that, about it. yeah, the reason for that is because it was historically never a problem. <laughs> their range and the range of ticks never yeah. um, were in the same place. Now they've got this problem with ticks. They don't know what to do about it. If they get irritated enough, they will scrape them off by rubbing against trees, uh -huh. but that breaks their fur off. So they freeze to death. Oh boy. This is not good. So it's, not a, it's, it's a lose lose situation. It's, yeah, absolutely it is. And of course, ticks uh, are spreading Lyme disease, which in 1995 there was no Lyme disease in Vermont to speak of. Now it's fairly common. There's different ticks, but it's the same problem. Different ticks, yeah. Okay, we're up to Saturday. Are we up to Saturday? We are uh, not up to not Saturday. Not up to Saturday yet. Got we one are more up here. to a, an item from Tech Guide. Solar storage batteries set to surge after a sun end <coughs> decides to build Australian manufacturing plant. Solar storage batteries are projected to grow at a rate of uh, up to 300%. The news is that a battery manufacturing plant will be built in South Australia. Everything is happening in South Australia. <laughs> Sometimes it seems that way. Yeah, and a residential battery uh, power rebate will also kick off in that state. German battery making, maker Sonnen will have its new manufacturing, pl manufacturing plant near Adelaide creating hundreds of jobs. Sonnen is such an interesting company. Was the world's leading solar battery manufacturer. They've made more than 35,000 of these things. These are not flashlight batteries. No, no, but this is a couple of guys from Wildpolsried in Germany. From where? Wildpolsried. <laughs> Wildpolsried. Say it again for the West Coast. <laughs> Wildpolsried. <laughs> If, if you know how to do it, you can trill the R from your throat. You don't need read, you see. Wildpoltried <laughs> um, was, was one, uh, I think, one of the first towns in Germany to, uh, to become uh, a, a net positive for the grid. It produces more electricity than it consumes. Did we talk about that on the show? We've talked yeah. about it a couple okay. of times. And a couple of guys in Wildpolsley decided that they were going to make batteries. That was only about six or eight years ago. Now they're the big, they're, they're... Right place at the right time. They're what Tesla is competing against. Yeah. And they're building this thing. Although, honestly, I think that, I think that the batteries in China are going to, are going to put both Tesla and Sonnen to shame. Sonnen did a lot of work in Puerto Rico after, after Hurricane Maria. Did they, huh? Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Yeah, let's move along here. Saturday, February 24th, and we have an item it. from KUCB and up. a picture of Unalaska. <laughs> it's not, it's not un Unalaska, It's huh? Unalaska. Unalaska. At least that's what I've been told. Well, when well, I checked it out, it, it means the uh, town or the place near the peninsula, which evidently means Alaska. Alaska peninsula. is peninsula, yeah. Yeah, in the Aleut language. Yeah, yeah. So 
Unalaska revisits wind power, hoping for a renewable energy source. This is an interesting it's article. It's nice like a little town. Yeah, it is. Residents of the Alaskan island of Unalaska know the island's wind is strong. It can blow over 100 miles an hour. In 2005, a study funded by the city council to look at the potential of wind power found that there was no technology strong enough to withstand Unalaska's wind. That's interesting. Now the technology has changed and they're looking again. Well, just to give you some idea where Unalaska is, it's the largest city on the Aleutian Island. So it's yes. hanging down there in the Aleutians. It's about two-thirds of the way down the chain. Yeah. It's toward the end. During the Second World War... The, the Japanese took no, over. The, Unalaska? Yeah. I, they took over Atu and Kiska. They were there. I don't know if they took it over, but they had a presence on that island because I read about it yesterday. Okay. Um, the the this area was difficult for the Americans during, and it was far more difficult for the Japanese. For the Japanese to hold two islands in the uh, on the Aleutians was a problem. Uh -huh. They were it would have been better off if they'd forgotten that whole plan. Of course, they would have been better off if they'd forgotten the Second World War before it started. But <laughs> but. Um, they, uh, the, the, you know, I, I have read a lot about military operations and the problem they had in the, in the, uh, in the Aleutians, the Americans had, was that it was very difficult to patrol because of these high winds. And they, you know, the, one of the things that they found was that the Aleutians are one of the few places in the world where you can have high winds combined with fog for weeks at a time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, it looks like they, they might <coughs> very well be on top of something now. Yeah. If, if this thing works, they're going to have turbines all over those islands. Who is the, who is the, what is the, the turbine manufacturer in Barrie, Vermont? Is that Northern Power Systems? I don't know. They, I make, don't know. they make turbines that are specifically designed for stressful conditions. <coughs> good for them. Hope they get a couple. They're of very more, good at it. A couple of <coughs> out of this. Yeah, our next item is from Clean Technica. Well, this is a <coughs> bit of a surprise of something we've already talked about today. Yes, emissions from fracking five times higher than reported. A study from the Environmental Defense Fund found that fr uh, methane escaping from fracking operations in Pisi in Pennsylvania causes the same near-term climate pollution as eleven. Uh, coal-fired power plants and is, quote, five times higher than what oil and gas companies report to the state. Early assessments are found similar results in New Mexico. Now, this there's a reason why both of these articles are here. This and that is, is more in-depth than the other They one. say different things. Uh -huh. um, and, of course, what, what one of the things this one is talking about is, is uh, states other than Pennsylvania. <coughs> One of the things that we've talked about on the show a number of times, actually, was, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, I'm trying to think of which university it was in the Boston area. It was not Northeastern. I've forgotten. But they, they the students did a, a survey. They had a car that was equipped with a methane tester. Mm -hmm. And they just drove through every street in Boston. Mm -hmm. And they found 2,400 leaks, as I Recall. I recall reading about that. Yeah. Yes. And then that was stunning. The the one of the I think it might have been the National Re Natural Resources Defense Fund or one of those organizations tried to duplicate those results to yeah. see if they could were really reliable. And instead of 2,400, they found 3,000. So <laughs> <laughs> we have a we have a massive problem with pro with gas leaks. Well, the takeaway from here. Kind of dire, really. Fracking is nothing less than a loaded gun pointed straight at the head of every man, woman, and child alive. Yeah. However, it has become a matter of national pride for the United States. Yeah, well. For the first time, it is now one of the largest producers of oil and gas in the world. Yes, the, and more than half of the oil and gas from the United States comes from fracking. Comes from fracking. And Absolutely. this is an absolute horrible nightmare type problem and we've got you know the earthquakes in Oklahoma we've got um, disruption of, of 
wells and bubbles coming up in streams. And a lot of strange things happening. Well, strange things are happening. There was a song called Strange Things Are Happening. <laughs> strange things are happening. You remember it. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica, and we're escaping fracking and looking at something else. Germany awards 900 megawatts in wind and solar tenders in year's first auctions. This is significant. Yes. Germany, uh, Germany's federal ne network agency. Do we have a picture coming up here? We do. We do. Bingo. Announced the winners of its first offshore wind and solar auctions in uh, 2018, awarding more than 900 megawatts to over 100 separate projects. Of course, the, the bulk of those projects are going to be solar, and it doesn't take many offshore wind projects to get you know, a lot of e energy into the thing like this. The successful wind energy bids were up slightly from those of a similar auction in November. They were more highly priced. Yeah, I got much. some prices there. The uh, wind energy has been going from 4.6 to 6.4 cents. But the solar prices were below those of the wind power. 4.7 to 5.6. That 5. is 6. significant. And that's the first time, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yes. that's significant. Cost of solar power is diving. The cost of wind power is going down in general. But, but solar's going down quicker. Yeah, and, you know, this is an interest. You know, I think early on in, our, in this show, I think it was on this show, it might have actually been before this show started, which was, what, a little over four years ago, there was a, there was a, a, a law case in Minnesota where a solar company won um, an, a bid for solar power and the public utility people who were ass assessing these bids, it was in Minnesota, mm -hmm. said, we're going to go with that instead of natural gas peaking plants because it's cheaper. And the people at the, in, in the natural gas industry took them to court, and they said, it's not cheaper. Look at the numbers. And they, the, of course, you look at numbers, and a lot depends upon what angle you're looking at them from. Good point. And the, uh, the judge looked at them, and he said, no, <laughs> solar is cheaper. you got to look at this over time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the idea that solar was cheaper than gas peaking plants four, five years ago was new. This is new in exactly the same way. Solar is cheaper than wind for the first time. For the first time, yeah. And wind power is, in general, even offshore wind is cheap now compared to other sources. But wind power in general is the cheapest source of electricity we've got. Mm -hmm. And solar power is gradually going below that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're up to Sunday, February 25th, and an item from Clean Technica. Solar will dominate new electricity generation in the U.S. by 2022. I think this guy was listening to what I was just <laughs> saying. He was too. <laughs> Yuri Horwitz, co-founder of C and CEO of Soul Systems, says he and his company expect solar power to be the dominant form of new electricity generation by 2022. A report dated February 15, 2018, lists three reasons why we might believe solar will be as ascendant in the U.S. market over the next four years, in spite of new tariffs on imported solar products. Well, I got the three reasons. What are they? One, strong solar, strong public support. Yeah. Two, rapid technological evolution that drives down costs and increases efficiency. Yes. We see that happening. Yes. Three, significant and increasing support for the solar asset class by institutional investors. Yes. These are the smart guys. Yes. And there's a takeaway here that's kind of I'll, I'll read it because it's accurate. <coughs> Capitalism cares not a way for sentiment or saving polar bears. It cares about the bottom line. Yeah. Bingo. That's what it's all about. You know. That's exactly what Yuri believes. Yeah. Well, I, I have to tell you, I think that's short-sighted. I don't think he's wrong about the three reasons. Capitalism, if it, if it believes in the bottom line and nothing else, is short-sighted. Yeah. And... Part of the problem is you have, you know, there are certain things that you just can't put a dollar value on. What's the dollar value of freedom? What's freedom? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. Um, well, I hear what you're saying, though. Yeah. Okay. Should we move on? 
Yeah, this is an interesting one too. We got a picture here. We do up. indeed. This is from um, Electrek. Yeah, Look at that. That is a picture of a solar plant in Egypt. Yeah, it reminds me. Is that me of real or is that protected? Mummy, mummy movies. I think that's real. The there, there are things going on in this picture that I think would not go on if it were a, if it were a rendering. If you see that that cross kind of shaped thing that's right in the middle of the array, a little bit above the center. Yeah, yes, I do that see that. Is a, that is a moiré pattern, which yeah. is result, results from an interference of the solar panels, which have a regular um, uh, positioning and so the pixels that, in the camera. That's sort of happening by accident. It wouldn't happen in a drawing. It wouldn't happen in a drawing. Another thing, too, by the way, you can tell if you look at this thing that this particular picture is happening at sunrise, not sunset. I'm yes. sorry, sunset, not sunrise. Okay. I've got it backwards, you know, who knows. Why is it sunset? I would have thought it was sunrise. Um, the, the panels on the left side there are reflecting the sun better. And the left side of those panels is raised. And what that means is that south is okay. to the right. And so if south is to the right, then we're looking at east and that means this is sunrise. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was babbling before, and <laughs> you were right, and you know, but it's just that's the way it is. Well, what we're looking at here is the world's largest solar park, and this is only a part of it. Yeah. And it's under development in Egypt. This is going to be a biggie. This is going to be a biggie. Okay, the Bendham Solar Park near Aswan, Egypt, aims to reach. 1.6 gigawatts to 2 gigawatts of solar power capacity by the middle of, 19, of 2019. The project will receive no incentives. It will be given a 25-year contract to sell its electricity at 7.8 cents per kilowatt hour to the state-owned... That, that's not an incentive? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm thinking it's... To the, <laughs> the state-owned Egyptian Electricity Commission Company with a cost pegged to the U.S. dollar. Boy, is that a mistake. You know, the, <laughs> way, that the way the, the, way the U.S. is working right now, I, you know, we've got, I don't know what to say about the government in Washington. Well, there's a couple of quick takeaways here that we, I never realized. The eastern region of the Sahara Desert yeah. has some of the best solar power resources in the, on the planet. Yes. Okay, it's better than the U.S.-Mexico western desert, which is good. Yeah. And maybe just behind the world's best spot, which I didn't realize, is the Chilean Desert Islands. Yes. Okay. okay. And they're putting up solar up there. Yes. And it, there's a map on this site that shows bands of, of sunlight starting at the Mediterranean and going inland. And about every 50 miles, you get into a band where the sunlight is stronger than it was previously. There's about 10 bands in a row. Yeah. And wow. this is about band seven out wow. of 10. Okay, we've got an item here from uh, Clean Technica. Aha. Aha. Sem Tesla semi trucks to pay for themselves in a ye year and a half. This is kind of amazing. It is. An exec, exec at DHL, which is Deutsche Post, is quoted as saying that the payback period on the Tesla Semi, the period of time that it takes to pay for the difference in initial costs compared to, to a conventional uh, diesel Semi truck, would be under 1.5 years. So after only 1.5 years, the company is already experiencing a net savings while using cleaner trucks. And you know what that tells me? The difference between a Tesla and a regular truck is about three hundred thousand dollars. So the so it is going to be earning after that payback, it's going to be earning an extra hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. That seems to me to make sense. By the way, this DHL yeah. used to used to stand for Document Handling Limited. <laughs> and they were are like the U, the FedEx of Europe. Yes. When I was in Saudi Arabia we used <coughs> DHL exclusively to send stuff back and forth to the USA. Wow. So they were very reliable. And the Saudi post office was not. Yes. Very unreliable. My, 
My brother lived in Liberia, and he told me that if you sent a package to Liberia, yeah. the first thing they did at the post office was open it up to see what was inside. So they could steal it. <laughs> well, no, it, it, they weren't interested in stealing things, although if it was food, they'd eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the CHL company has grown. Yes. Uh, Deutsche Post is the name of their mail handling company, yes. which is the old German post office that they privatized. Yes. And this company has just grown, and they are... Big. Big now. Yeah. Worldwide big. And they do a lot more than just document handling. They make trucks. <laughs> they make trucks. Okay, we're up to Monday, February 26th. And we Monday have Monday the twenty sixth and we got another picture here. We do. Yeah, these guys this, are these guys are here. looking for clams. Yes, they and are. We have they? an item from Science Nordic. Climate change draws invasive species to the Arctic. Scary. Temperatures in the Arctic are increasing twice as fast as the global average, and, and sea ice is retreating quicker than predicted. While humans react slowly to the problem at hand, evidence suggests that animals are on the move. In the cold Arctic, invasive species are drawn to regions where they could not previously have survived. And what they're finding there is, is a species called blue clams. That's particularly, that's the, mostly what this article is about. Yeah, and they have a, a bunch of other species that are attracted to the clams. You know there are fish that crush clam shells. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I don't know how they do it, but they, they have can't stomp fish, on them. Fish are funny. <laughs> they, they have, like, some species have teeth in their throats. Do they really? Yeah. yeah. Huh? Well, what's happening here, of course, is these species that f formerly existed in very small numbers yeah. are now thriving and they're crushing out some of the native species. Yeah. Okay, we have an item from Singapore Business Review. Yeah, this is a good one. China and India renewable power use to explode over the next decade. The Asia-Pacific region is expected to add more than 500 gigawatts of non-hydro-renewables capacity by That's 2027. A That's a lot. <laughs> That's a very this lot. This is almost twice the 900 and, uh, two, 290 gigawatts additional expected in Western Europe and North America combined. The Asia-Pacific uh, share of the total global Renewables capacity is likely to re increase from 45% in 2017 to 51% in 2027. We are falling behind China so fast. It's unbelievable. In so many ways. Oh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. China's manufacturing more than half of the electric cars that are made. Yeah. They've made over 300,000 electric buses. There are only 300 in the United States. What is going on wrong here? here? <laughs> and when BYD, a Chinese company, yeah. wanted to build a big plant in North America to manufacture electric buses, and which was going to cost billions of dollars, where do you suppose they put it? Canada. Canada, because <laughs> they don't like the they don't like the the environment for for um, uh, investment in the United States. I think Canada made them a much better deal. I don't think the United States was interested in making a deal at all. Probably not. So, you know, save of the jobs of a couple hundred coal miners, cost the jobs of 10,000 solar installers, but it and plays prevent... Well in Peoria. Oh, man. <laughs> well, let's move along here. We could... This is an interesting one. It's kind of a scary one. Saudi Arabia edging closer to nuclear arms with Trump's help. Yeah, this is scary. It's very worrisome. And it, it is. It tells me that the United States is not interested in maintaining the safety of its partners or following the, the, uh, the dicta of, of treaties it signed. This is from the Tasnim News Agency. Saudi Arabia is in talks with American nuclear firms to enter the nuclear power business and erect as many as 16 nuclear reactors purportedly only to generate, this is purportedly only to generate electricity for 25 years, a New York Times report said. But the report also said there are growing signs that the Saudis want to have the option 
of building nuclear weapons. That's what this is all about. That's what it's all about. They have plenty of oil. They have plenty of sand. They have plenty of sunlight. And they have plenty of Why wind. Why do they want nuclear when they got all of that sunlight? Well, so they can manufacture the various things that are needed to make bombs. That's exactly what we're what they're saying here. You know, but the but the Trump administration and, and they doesn't do seem have this this I've observed because I used to live there, so I keep on top of things. Yeah, they kind of believe that they are destined to rule Islam. Yes, well, they and Islam they, is destined to rule the world. Yes, so they're destined to rule the world. Yeah, all they've got to do is figure out how to rule China. Um, the the uh, Saudis have extremely powerful influence over Islam. And oh, definitely. Islam has got... Is and, it, it, and it's a particularly fundamental form of Islam. Yes. And their biggest problem with that form of Islam, from what I can gather, is that it is opposed by Iran, which is just, Absolutely. It's just it's across totally, the Persian Gulf. It's sort of like the difference between Catholics and Protestants. Yeah. And it's, it's, Iran is just across the Persian Gulf. And you know that the Iran, Iranians are... are working on nuclear bombs of their own. And if you don't know that, you might be right, but you're, you know. <laughs> I would say that they would like to, but they made a deal. And they made a deal to prevent from you know, them being blasted. There is a proverbial, proverbial position, which is the Persian rug merchant. Never make a deal with a Persian <laughs> rug merchant. That's a good point. You know, uh, the, the um, I don't know, they, maybe we should just move on. Well, there's a quick takeaway here. Yeah. Westinghouse and other American-based companies are discussing a consortium to bid on this multi-million dollar project. Multi-billion dollar multi project. Multi-billion dollar. And given Trump's flip attitude toward nuclear weapons, Congress's responsibility affects the future of not just Saudi Arabia, but the decisions that Turkey, Egypt, and other countries make about acquiring nuclear power. Yeah. And Russia just today announced they got a brand new nuclear missile. Yeah, which is in, impossible to, ca to, to stop. So they say. Invincible. Well, they had invincible nuclear missiles before. Um, you know, I'm, you, you, there's no, po <laughs> no point in worrying about that. Well, let's move on here. All right, Tuesday, here. February 27th, and we've got a picture of a geothermal plant. That's a geothermal Iceland. plant, yeah. yeah. That's, that's that is steam coming up, not smoke. Yep. And uh, th this is an item from The Guardian. More than 100 cities now mostly powered by renewable energy. The number of cities uh, reporting that they are mainly powered by clean energy has more than doubled since 2015. This is worldwide. Worldwide, yes. Data published by the not-for-profit um, environmental impact researcher CDP found that 101 of more than 570 cities on its books sourced at least 70% of their electricity from renewable sources in 2017 compared to 42 in 2015. I went into the, the um, data that they had yeah. and I found the there there were um, I think 43 cities that are a hundred percent dependent on renewable power for electricity something like that yep one in the United States so f 42 of them are not in the United States one is it's Burlington more it's Burlington Vermont yeah. more than half of them were in Brazil is that so yeah wow but it it struck me that here is the United States, and it's in the it's not in the number one position. It's not in the number two, three, or four position. There were three countries tied for that. It's in the number five position, mm -hmm. and the countries that it's in that position with, Cameroon, you know, I mean, these are th th there's a set of countries there that that have cities that are 100 percent renewable, Colombia. You know, and the United States is in that in that category. You would think that we would be able to do better than that. One might think. One might well, think. In, in many cases, <coughs> renewable energy is generated by hydro. 
in, which is why Brazil has got yeah. it. And, and now, by the way... Some of these countries have a lot of hydro. Brazil imports most of its hy hy hydro from Paraguay. Do they? Yeah, Paraguay produces a thousand percent of the energy that it needs from renewables. That's a good position <laughs> to be in. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Let's move along here. Yep, we've got a, uh, an item from the Daily Sabah. I'm pronouncing the H. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what they do in Arabic, of course. Yeah. Turkish I don't know what they do Arabic, in Turkish. But, uh, you know what I, really throws me? What, the, what language do they speak in, in Iran? Do you know? Farsi. Why is it called Farsi? What's a version of the word Persian? <laughs> in Iran, it's called Parsi. Okay. You know, the traditional Western uh, name is Persian. They yeah. call it Parsi. Okay. Obviously, it's the same word. Yeah. Farsi is called Farsi because there's no P in Arabic. <laughs> this is not, is not, right. not their name, it's the Arab's name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's no it's it's farther from the original than Persian, <laughs> arguably. Well, let's <coughs> read the headline here. Okay. A GNC highlighted for Turkey's first offshore wind power farm. This blew me away. The Turkey a Turkish Energy and Natural Resources Minister, Barat Al-Barak, announced that the ministry would hold a tender for Turkey's first offshore wind power plant and that the wind farm would be the largest of its kind in the world. Of its <coughs> kind. Of its kind. It's still going to be big. The wind power farm will be building the Aegean Sea. Turkey has a potential for 32,000 megawatts of offshore wind power. So you got a lot of potential. Yeah. Do you know what kind of, of power plant this is that it's the biggest of? No, I don't. Offshore wind in which the wind turbines are anchored on the or ocean floor. Well, the article does say that it's, it's shallow there, so they're cheaper. This is as opposed to unanchor, uh, unanchored or loose floating. Yeah, floating ones that we and talked a, about. I think there's a total of one floating wind farm in the world and it has five turbines in it so <laughs> yeah this is a, this is very significant the Turks have decided they're going to do something they have not been doing much to date so well they got the option yeah I have a pain in my foot that happens oh. every once in a while I hate it when that happens and uh, yeah <laughs> uh, we have an item here from Clean Technica Sun power to cut estimated 200 jobs and incur 20 plus million dollar restructuring costs in the wake of our solar tariff. What? American solar manufacturer SunPower has announced restructuring plans in the wake of Donald Trump's imposition of a 30% tariff on solar modules and cells following a Section 201 trade case. The plans will see the company cut up to 250 jobs and it will incur restructuring costs between 200 million and 300 million. That tariff is is costing jobs in exactly the area of of uh, production that it's meant to to uh, protect. And they, and they should have known that in advance. Well, they probably did, but they again, probably it did. Plays well in Peoria. Yeah, well. <laughs> You've heard me say where, that before. Where is Peoria? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, you want you have more on this? Not really. Okay. Not really. I mean, I do, but it's it's irrelevant. Well, tell me. Tell well, us. Well, the, the restructuring is intended to reduce operating expenses and overhead, while focusing on improving profitability. Duh. 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 <laughs> okay, we can go on. A substantial portion of its restructuring costs will be occur incurred in the first and second quarters of 2018. Right. Which means likely we will see those job cuts pretty soon. They're happening already. They're happening already. Yeah. Okay. So we are up to last day. Wednesday, February twenty eighth. We have a picture coming up. Yeah, we do. It's a nice picture too. It's an interesting picture. It uh, it shows a a an atmospheric thing called a sun pillar. Yeah. <coughs> and this is an item from CNN. And this is really disturbing. Arctic temperatures surge in the dead of winter. By the way, this, this, art, this whole article is a good one to look up. 
It starts off with a nice video yep. called Facts First, Climate Change is Real. Yes. It's about a minute and a half, and it's well worth looking at. Well, you know, I don't know where people get the idea that climate change isn't happening. And I don't know where people get the idea that, um, that I do know where they get the idea, actually. It, it comes from people who are going to lose money That's what's happening, as we yeah. address the problem of ch climate change. And honestly, I think those people are selling the United States out altogether. Uh, because so For some near-term profits. For near-term profits. They're as bad as Benedict Arnold, as far <laughs> as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, this is from CNN. Uh, temperatures in the Arctic have soared well above freezing this week marking the highest temperatures recorded in the region during winter. Scientists from the Danish Meteorological Institute said this. Temperatures from February in eastern Greenland and central Arctic averaged about 15 degrees Celsius or 27 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than season norms. And by the way, <coughs> the temperature on the northern tip of Greenland yeah. in February uh, got usually, usually way below zero. 50 degrees above normal. This is not right. No, it's not right. By the way, look if you want to look up this uh, this this particular website. Yeah. There's an animated view of the Earth from the North Pole. Yes. With the <coughs> temperature changes depicted on this rotating map yep. by colors. Yeah. And it's scary. It is. We've we've seen that kind of stuff on the show before. Yeah, we have, but we not have. from the poles. Not from uh, directly above yeah, the poles, that's, no. That's what's interesting and about this. One. It is very interesting. And another thing that was interesting is that it had this warm thing going on in Alaska and Greenland and the North Pole. And it's cold in Europe. Meanwhile, they've got a terrible problem in Europe because yeah. of the cold and yeah. the snow. Yeah. It's snowing it's in Rome. In Rome. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Okay. Well, a quick takeaway here. Although the Arctic has seen temperatures climbing for decades, the past few, few years have seen the most extreme changes. More worryingly, the warming weather pattern is producing a circular, circular effect. The warmer the air and water, the less sea ice there is. The less sea ice there is, the warmer the air and water can get. This in turn leads to less sea ice and a vicious cycle continues. This is basically, we were talking about this tipping point a couple of years ago. Um, this is Al why Gore, it's happening. Yeah, Al Gore referenced it in his first movie and we're seeing that projection turn into reality. Only one thing is certain, strange weather. Well, that's always been the case. Well, it's stranger than strange <laughs> this time. Yes, it is. Okay, right. our next item is from NHK World. TEPCO, we'll assume for <coughs> you don't know what that is, ask for a smaller tsunami in a simulation. <laughs> in Tokyo this goes back to yep. 2008. Yep, in Tokyo District Court, a TEPCO employee, TEPCO is T Tokyo Electric Power Company, a TEPCO employee testified that in 2008 he was in charge of estimating the height of a tsunami that might hit the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. He estimated that it could be as high as 15.7 meters. It's 50 feet. Yeah, it's also one meter higher than the tsunami that actually did hit. Yeah. It's very close to yeah. that size. He testified that he was asked to, to decrease his estimate the tsunami that wrecked the plant was nearly that size. This is this is a, a, a group of people who interfered with the um, engineering of the Fukushima Daiichi's defenses in order to save money. Mm -hmm. Now, the the um, seawall there was 5.7 meters. That's like about 20 feet. And in order to get to the 15.7, they would have had to make it 30. It may, make it. 10 meters higher. Had they done that, the world would be in a different shape, wouldn't it? It would be. <laughs> but you see, here's the problem. Yeah. When you make a when you make a seawall and then you decide to increase it by, mm -hmm. you have to increase the height. You also have to increase the it's width. Sort of like a pyramid. It's kind of like a pyramid. And I don't know what it would have cost to increase the size of that seawall by 10 meters, but I think it might have cost billions of dollars. I think it probably would have cost less than the damage it incurred. Probably. <laughs> Probably. There was a guy 
You know, the, yeah. the, <clears throat> that, that power plant never should have been built. No, you're right there. Right there. When that, when that, you know, if you look at the northeast coast of Japan and you look at, look at it historically, that particular tsunami's highest wave was 37 and a half meters. That's about wow. 10 stories. But that was farther up the coast. The highest waves in the tsunami of 1933 were 27 and a half meters, and the highest waves in the tsunami of 1896 were 37 and a half meters. And this 15.7 meters is realistic. 5.7 is not. And just not. You yeah. Know? And I've been saying all along, you know, somebody walked into a room and said, how high is the seawall going to be? And somebody in the room said, well, how much can we afford to, to spend on it? Something like that's what happened, sure. And that, this, this is basically that. They back-engineered it. They back-engineered it. What can I say? Okay, our this final is last item. item is from ETEnergyWorld.com. Wind and solar could be 80% of U.S. demand for electricity. <laughs> I love this. Wind and solar could meet 80% of the U.S. demand for electricity as That's long current. as... Yeah. They're not talking 20 years from now. I mean, if, if it was fully if, employed, yeah. what's existing in could the, do it. Current technology yeah. could do this. As long as improvements are made in transmission and storage, but those, tra those improvements are to current technology. Yes. Re researchers said, until a few years ago, these energy sources were thought to be capable of supplying only about 20 to 30 percent of U.S. needs, the report from the Energy and Environmental Science said. And of course, it wasn't very many years before that that they were saying, well, it could, couldn't do more than 10 percent. <clears throat> well, they're even making a mistake here talking about transmission, because I think in the future, we're not going to need as much transmission as they're projecting. That's it's very possible. But the other thing too, Tom, I went to find out about transmission years ago. Yeah. And I found a report from the DOE that said, if, if, if that we lose nine point six percent, it was yeah, above nine, above no, nine, but it was 10. yeah, of, ten of our uh, uh, electric trans of our electricity um, as it's being in 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 long distance transmission lines, and. The greatest distance that you can transmit electricity um, uh, cost effectively is about, I, I don't remember, 1,500 miles. I was going to say 1,000 miles, but okay. Okay. 1,500. Ten years later, yeah. the loss for current technology had been reduced to 9.5, uh, from 9.5 or 9.6 percent down to about 6.5. And the greatest distance at which you could transmit AC power was 2,500 miles, and DC power was 4,000. So we're getting to a point now where you can transmit it almost anywhere. Yeah, and now we've got transmission lines that where the where the power is uh, 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 loss is down to to less than three percent. Well, they got these superconducting power that's lines right. where they and have to refrigerate them. The, and, and the cost that's, of refrigerating is less than the loss. That's right. Yeah. And with that rate of percentage, we could get our power from Tasmania. We well, could they get from us. Yeah, <laughs> we could get our power from China. We could get our power from, you know, Tierra del Fuego. It doesn't well, matter. You know, it's kind of stretching things, but it's not impossible for Quebec with their hydro to power both North and South America. I think they have enough potential. Wow. Okay. I guess we're up to the end of our of our. Of this our is thing. the last one. Yeah. Which I so think I already said. Wind and solar did. can meet eighty percent. Yep, we read it. So I think it's it's uh, time. A quick takeaway here. Oh, Currently, okay. the U.S. is getting about two thirds of its electricity from fossil fuels. Yes. One fifth of U.S. electricity comes from nuclear, and another fifteen percent is generated from renewables. That's right now. Yeah. With wind contributing 7%, solar 1%, hydro <coughs> and other sources account for the balance of the clean energy source. <coughs> That's going to change. Yes. It's definitely going to change. I mean, why, why pay for fuel when you don't have to? Yeah. Put us up, Tom. Together. We'll say goodbye. I think I can when we see you together. <laughs> have a perfectly lovely week. That's what the
the sign back there says. Bye-bye. <laughs>